Okay, perfect. Hi folks, welcome, good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Nancy Torres. I'm the hotline supervisor here at Housing Court Answers. We're a citywide organization providing direct resources through our hotline. Welcome, we have uh, great presenters today from CASA. We have Hal, Ber um, Hal Burgos from working in CASA since April 2021 as a tenant organizer. And we also have CASA leader, Marilyn Mullins, who's joining us from a landline. Um, so unfortunately you won't be able to see her, but she will be speaking from 1191 um, landline you see on Zoom for folks who are on the Zoom. And she's been organizing since 2017 with CASA. Um, and part of this workshop that you'll be hearing is, uh, you know, her tenant association campaign and presenting on those tenant tactics on how to file for repairs, how to fight for repairs in your building, how to fight for, um, you know, out, out on the ground and as well in housing court. Um, we'll also do a Q&A at the end. So feel free to drop your questions in the um, chat. And if you cannot drop them, we'll be able to answer questions towards the end. Um, we'll also, as a part of a community agreement, we do ask for folks to keep your mics off um, so that while the folks are presenting, they are able to share their information. And then I'll pass it over to Hal. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, it's so nice to see you all. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So um, yeah, so as Nancy said, thanks, Nancy. Um, today, we're going to be talking about right how to get repairs. Um, it's the kind of thing that uh, tenant associations at CASA fight really hard for. And so uh, we're going to be sharing a little bit about um, our model, as well as going through a few different tactics, um, why we do those tactics, and you know what it looked like at 1072 Woodycrest, where Maryland organized. Um, so, um, and then at the end, um, and also talk a little bit, I think, about ongoing challenges, how things have been, um, especially since uh, their campaign hasn't been quite as active. Um, and then we'll have lots of time for questions. So. Um, I mean, the first thing we really wanted to talk about uh, is forming a tenant association. Uh, CASA has a model of collective action, meaning that um, uh, as an organization, we uh, support tenants coming together and we support tenant associations in the Southwest Bronx um, in fighting for repairs. Um, our model empowers collective action, right? You're more powerful acting together than by yourself. Um, and so uh, we identify buildings in a, in a variety of ways. Uh, organizers do cold outreach uh, to buildings who have been identified as having a lot of violations, um, or tenants will reach out to us and let them know about their struggles getting repairs from their landlord. Um, and so, um, Generally, uh, organizers will go to a building and do this outreach to assess whether or not a building seems like a good candidate to organize. Um, after that, um, organizers and tenants will hold a Know Your Rights meeting uh, where we talk about very basically what tenants' rights is, especially rent-stabilized tenants. Um, our base is rent-stabilized tenants in the Southwest Bronx. Um, and that meeting is for folks to have some information about different ways they can organize and to build consensus on whether or not uh, tenants should be organizing um, in a tenant association. Um, and then after that, once the tenant, tenants have uh, consensus on whether to form a tenant association, uh, folks will volunteer to join a steering committee or an organizing committee um, in order to plan next steps in the campaign. Um, and so now um, I'll let Marilyn share a little bit about uh, her process organizing a tenant association. Okay, thank you, Hal. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marilyn. I'm a CASA leader and also a tenant association leader. Since we began organizing activity, we have experienced 
challenge, especially making sure there is consistency in tenants association. Some key leaders move away and others do not feel as much urgency to get involved as before. This is common in organizing campaigns. We tend to be longer than folks expected, as well as emotional, and require a high level of coordination. We have also felt burnout for waiting for waiting from response from HPD and DHCR. These agencies often do not deliver the results that tenants expect, as well as taking a long time to respond. They are also not as thorough as tenant need, especially in the following up to make sure that repairs are being done. All in all, through my biggest part of advice is do not stop the fight. Stay on top. Landlords, because when you fight, you win. Rent reduction. After tenants begin to organize a common tactic, is applying for a rent reduction. This is done if the landlord is not providing service that the apartment or common area. Couple things on rent reduction. First of all, you can file a rent reduction together as a group, or you can do it by yourself. But um, in my building, we did it as a group, and we got way more than what we expected to get. It's always good to do things in a group. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm running off at the mountain. I never lost my spot. Okay. Um, Marilyn, uh, no problem. Do you want to talk a little bit about why you all decided to start a tenant association? Oh, sure. I would love to. I love talking about this. The reason why 1072 Woody Crest, that's in the Highbury section of the Bronx, started um, a tenant association is because our landlord came into our building. He brought the building. When he brought the building, he started renovating. He didn't care anything about the old tenant. Um, I was in between two apartments that was being renovated at the same time, and my landlord never gave me the common courtesy to say, I'm going to renovate these apartments. But what happened was, while he was renovating, the mice and roaches started running into my apartment, and the dust and everything... And not just my apartment, other apartments in the building also. And he was renovating the empty apartment, but he was not giving service to the tenant in the building. Well, Casa came into the building and explained about what was going on. During that time, I knew nothing. I tell you nothing about, um, what do you call that thing? Um... When the landlord comes in and he do all these changes and then he slap you with a bill. My landlord came into my building and he renovated apartments. He put on a new roof. He put up a new elevator. And with all this stuff, he took our gas. He took our gas for six months. We had to cook on hot plate. And it was so horrible during that time. So the tenants got together, and we decided to do the tenant association. We did the tenant association. We band together. We filed for rent reduction, and we got the rent reduction. And we took him to court. By us taking him to court, we won the case because um, the violation he had in the apartment, he's trying to do all of this so he can take our rent up, but it did not happen because we got together and we fought. We won the free store. We never got our gas back, and I'm 
listen to gas, but the stove he gave us, he gave them to us because they was cheap. It's hard to keep clean, whatever, but we have to stay on top of these landlords because they don't care about us. They don't care about us at all. Okay. Oh, I'm running on. I forgot my spot. Um, how could you tell me where I left off at? No, it's okay. Um, I think we're jumping around a little bit because I think, you know, I wanted to see, make sure that that context was there. Um, so what are some tactics uh, that, you know, rent reduction is one, but um, if you want to talk a little bit about how you got tenants on board uh, with organizing. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Once we did the tenants association, we had meetings, just the tenants, and we got together and we made a list. We went from apartment to apartment, made a list of what was wrong with our apartment, and we gave it to the lawyers. The lawyers took it to court and filed a court case. Now the landlord wants to speak to us. We took time out. And we made an appointment to speak with the landlord. So the landlord said, this is what we're going to do. Well, since we um, took your gas, we're going to give you the stove. You don't have to pay for the stove. That was a win for us. But still, I felt like we lost because we never got our gas back. So they gave us some... They did the roof. They did the elevator. So doing all of this, landlords are very tricky. You got to watch them. Doing when they did all of this, they slapped us with an MCI. A MCI is a major capital improvement. Is when your landlord comes into your building and they do things like they did to us. When they give you a new roof. When they give you a new elevator. When they paint your building, the whole inside of the building, when they give you new light fixtures in the hallway, they are going to charge you with an MCI. And another thing my landlord did when he came up in here, he upgraded our electricity. That was a good thing because we kept having electrical fires in the buildings. But he said it was going to cut our electricity bill down. But to me, I really don't see the difference. But you have to be careful when your landlords are doing all these major repairs because they're going to slap you with an MCI. And my MCI was, I'm in a two-bedroom apartment. My landlord charged me $33 per room. He charged me $33 for the master bedroom, $33 for the second bedroom, $33 for the kitchen, and $33 for the living room. That's how he did it. That's how my MCI looks right now. Right. And I think, like, you know, some things that I just want to pull out of that. Um, and these are things that, you know, we always have to be uh, conscious of when we're organizing a tenant association is keeping that consistency because like each tactic can lead to like a tactic from the other side, right? Like it's, uh, it's a campaign and there's a target and the target is not a static target. The target reacts based off of the actions that you make. Um, especially with things like an MCI. Um, I do just want to highlight like what Marilyn is saying in terms of outreach. Um, this is something that is really key in any tenant association as a base building tactic. Um, because uh, I will say like, this is not something that five people can do. I mean, depending on the size of the building, of course, but um, Marilyn, how big is your building? 48 units. Right. So if five people, that's a tenth of the building. Um, it's good if those folks get together, of course. Um, but um, one thing that tenant associations are always talking about and striving for is to uh, make sure that there is an established base in the building of at least 30 percent. But really, frankly, half is best. Um, and so 
when you do outreach, it's about building your base. So identifying what the issues are in the building and identify the people who are ready to take action um, on these issues. Uh, so calling, calling meetings is good, but sometimes you need to also have those one-on-one -on -one conversations um, in order to assess people and to see who is willing to take the action with you, um, which is something that I think Marilyn, your tenant association did a great job with. Uh, yes, we stuck together. Yeah. Um, so I, I know we jumped around uh, just a little bit. Um, I do just want to say, um, and I think Marilyn, maybe we should go into a little more detail about what it looked like uh, doing an HP action. But before that, like rent reduction, I will say like that is an example of how you build that base. It's really like, especially doing a building wide rent reduction, it's a very, um, it doesn't require very much um, on behalf of the individual tenants who sign on. They sign their name, they put their apartment, they indicate whether their apartment is rent stabilized or rent controlled. Um, and so it's both offering information about something they can do, um, especially like sticking together. Um, also, like it's a way to begin to ask you know, more in-depth questions. So like what's happening in your apartment, for instance, do you know that there's a tenant association that's been meeting monthly? Um, and also a way to, you know, get to meet people and to be able to not meet people because you want something from them, but because you are offering them an opportunity to get involved and by getting involved to um, have a benefit such as, you know, winning a reduced rent or winning a frozen rent. <laughs> um, Marilyn, you want to talk a little bit about uh, what the court process looked like for you, taking the landlord to court with an HP action? Uh, well, actually, um, we, we as in the tenants, we did not have to go to, go to court. Um, our lawyer, Johanna, she did everything for us, but if she needed information, she would call us and to ask, have the landlord started doing this? And she made sure that each tenant filled out the form of what is wrong with their apartment. And that's a major part right there, the lawyers working with you. So did, did Johanna go door knocking with you all and do outreach with you all? Well, actually, no, it was not Johanna. It was um, Jordan, Uraldi, and he, he's not there anymore, but his name was Davey. And we all went door knocking. We went door knocking and we had the application for those who didn't um, show up at the meeting. And Jordan speaks Spanish, so she was able to explain to them that um, even though um, you didn't come, you can still fill out this application because you live in this building. And then there's, there's also a problem we had with a lot of people that was not legal and they felt like, well, I guess they were scared. They didn't want to come out. We had a big problem with that. But um, even with the 48 unit in this building, we didn't get all 48, but we did get 25. And that was a big help right there. So you set a goal of getting half. That's what I'm hearing. Yes. Uh-huh. And also... We did a press conference. We got signs. We made signs and we stood in front of the building and we did a press conference letting the world know how our landlord treated us. Totally. Um, that's definitely, I appreciate you saying that, Marilyn, because that's something that I wanted to lift up. You know, I think 
HP actions right there is a way to take your landlord to court for repairs. And so the process of doing that is really kind of the same as any other action that a tenant association would do. It's having meetings, talking to people about what the next step is. And then for those who aren't there in order to continue building that base is having those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, and so that's why, like I, you can see here in the slide, like uh, I say the word established, we say the word established twice. Um, because it's really like not an action that can that is always easy for a tenant association to pull off unless they have had uh, a little bit of time in the organizing process um, and can stick together um, because like it requires more involvement um, and it requires folks taking a risk, uh, which is really the direct action. I will say like in our organizing work, like, I mean, doing getting the court order to get the repairs done is good but just as good is having the opportunity to do a direct action uh legal filings could be a good draw to get press um to cover what's been happening in your building to get elected officials to care about what's been happening in your building um and then also the landlord to care what's happening in the building so um at casa we have uh a practice of always using a, a court case as an opportunity to announce to the landlord and also to the public that the tenants are here, right? They're organized and they're going to be fighting to make sure that they, 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 you know, the landlord respects them and respects their rights. Um. And Marilyn, you said that the landlord agreed to meet with tenants after the court case, right? Well, uh, actually, um, he kept putting it off. It was before, during, and after. But the, the and, and meet twice with the landlord. You met twice. Yes, me. When we the first time we met with the landlord, we wanted to know what he was going to do for us because we wasn't allowing him to continue to do the repairs in these apartments and not looking out for the old tenants. Old tenants asked when I say old tenants asked in me, and there's like five or six other tenants that have lived in this building going on forty years. So I guess by us being the older tenants, we had more mouth than the rest of the tenants because the rest of the tenants, um, this really wasn't as important to them as it is to us because we made this building our home and we're not going to let you come in here and disrespect us like that. Right. So then... The landlord, but the landlord ended up meeting with you all after the court case. Yes. So, I mean, I think that's another thing is like these direct action, like it forces the, it can force the landlord to engage with tenants in a different way. And, the, and, and uh, um, I, I have to put this out there, even though we was going through all of this, the landlord has attacked it to try and intimidate tenants. He tried to intimidate some of the tenants up in here not to be part of this tenant association. A lot of them backed off, but a lot of them stayed. But landlords will try and intimidate you when you try to do a tenant association. What did you, what did you all do to combat that? Well, as I said before, as the old tenant, I'm one of the old tenants, and we got together as, uh, you might as well say, a group of the old tenants, and we confronted the landlord because we felt like, well, the new tenants, they don't know, they're scared. But I guess by the old tenants coming after the landlord, he started respecting us more. He started, uh, I would say, respecting us more as he started, also with the lawyer, he started doing repairs little by little. So it's a combination, right, of the legal strategy and the organizing strategy using that direct action. Yes. Did you, did you all go to the landlord's house? 
<laughs> no, we didn't take it that far. Or the, the landlord's office, I should say? No, we, we just stay here within the building. Okay, so then when they came to the meeting, that's when you all let them know that, like, call, basically calling out this practice of harassment. Yes, we set up a little table and chairs in the foyer. And we invited the landlord to come to see what we was doing and to listen to us. Yeah. Um, and I will, I will say also, like, that is a, the first step of um, most tenant association campaigns is to try and engage the landlord, right? Um, this is like, I think this is for a few reasons. One reason is to, uh, you know, try and negotiate with the landlord in good faith, um, not assume that they uh, understand exactly what's happening in the building. Although like the, you know, our political analysis allows us to assume that landlords know, generally know exactly what they're doing. Um, but it's to begin to, to talk to them in good faith, as well as, um, uh, being able to delineate and articulate exactly what's wrong in the building. Um, often, you know, the, so the first action of many tenant associations is to write a letter to the landlord requesting a meeting. Uh, often the landlord will ignore that, but then after this campaign um, or closer to the end of the campaign, um, the landlords will realize that they can no longer ignore tenants. And, and, and another thing we did be, um, when we met the landlord, we picked out a spokesperson, the person to speak to the landlord. And we also wrote down what we wanted to ask the landlord. We have like questions. What, what are you going to do for us? When are you going to do this? And um, we have one person to ask the landlord all these things. And another thing is, with the tenant association, you have to have meetings at least once a me once a month. Um, it's the vice president of the TA, it's the president of the TA, it's the secretary of the TA. You need somebody to take notes. So we have all this done. So at the next meeting, we read what we was going. We did at the last meeting, but it's always, always helpful to have one spokesperson when you're speaking to the landlord. Totally. Um, well, thank you. Um, I'm going to just move us along. And we kind of touched on this already. But, you know, when Marilyn and I were talking before, like, you know, one thing we wanted to highlight is the fact that there's a campaign, right? But the campaign um, is it for a short period of time, um, usually less than a year. Uh, and then afterwards, like, this is why we talk about consistency and numbers so often because people do drop out. People have lives, people's schedules change, uh, people move. And so the project is, is ongoing. Anything else you want to add to this, Marilyn? No, I could stop right there. Cool. Um, well, thank you folks. I'm seeing that there are people writing in the chat. I'm not uh, yes. looking at it, but maybe we can read out some of the, there's some questions, I guess. Um, and then yeah. obviously take questions from whomever. Uh, so I got, a, I pulled the, the questions as they were coming along, Harold. Okay. Um, so I'll share them out and then um, we can all bounce from each other to respond. So the first question um, was, I understand that any room in an apartment has to have vent to, has to have vents to the outside. My kitchen and bathroom both have a vent, but they are clogged and or the fan no longer works. The landlord did replacements. However, the vent in the kitchen is still not working. I've called through it once several times and the landlord said he has repaired it. Um, so when they come back, the inspector tells me that I have to go to court. Could you expand a bit more about the process of going to court to get repairs? Yeah, so I would, so I suppose, um, here, I can stop sharing my screen. I guess I'm wondering if the person's question was answered. Yeah, we definitely, you definitely heard um, folks touched upon 
So in going to housing court, so in terms of the process just of fighting for repairs as you are filing for that HP action that Hal mentioned, um, Let's see. Did you want to share anything in terms of like the documents or paperwork that they would have to bring in? And, yeah, I'm or, sorry. Or I, was only, I was only listening with one ear here. I, I missed that if you talked about it. So I need to go down there and just what do I need to bring with me to file to, you know, to, to get someone to look at this, to get them to fix the vent or the fan? Um, well, maybe a better question for Nancy, because we don't um yeah. actually do the documents so yeah yes yes um or so if there's an Steven, email or someone i can contact offline that'd yes, be great Steven, so just for a general information uh, and for for this workshop um you when you go to housing court you're given a several packages to fill out in court and you necessarily don't have to bring anything at the moment you're just writing down the repairs that you have um you have to have your landlord's address um, mainly and whoever you are suing so that when you're filling out that document um, on the HP repairs, you are prepared to file it. Um, the court clerks will not allow you to file if you do not have that full address and you can either call our hotline and I'll drop the number in a little bit and we can research that for you or you can go up to the help center um, and they can also pull that information. In turn, they'll give you a court date within two weeks and then from there, is always best to bring physical pictures um, to court regarding the the repair that you're having. And on so the I have back to go up on physical picture. So I have to go up on the Once, roof and take pictures of the fan. Well, in terms of, I mean, unfortunately, this is, is so the vent is not outside or it's inside. You're referring to a vent inside your apartment, correct? I have a vent in the ceiling that I believe goes up to the roof. And on the roof, there's a fan that draws air out of that room. It's supposed to draw air. So all you have to do is just take a picture of the vent inside your apartment because that's what okay. you're trying to share to the court. You're not trying okay. to, we don't want to share with anyone to go to your roof or anything like that. Um, so what you just have to do is write the location and the issue on that physical picture. So then you can show the judge and then they can um, be able to make copies for, for the case itself. But you'd get a court day within two weeks. It may be lagging a little bit now that you know the moratorium is over and more cases are coming up in court. But within two, two to three weeks is the time frame where you get a court. If you are in the Bronx or in Queens, we do have borough coordinators um, available at specific days um, that will be able to assist tenants. Um, I'll drop my email and I'll share packages in terms of how to fill out. The court have provide samples on how to fill out your HP action uh, when you're in court, but I can also drop my email so you can request that. And we'll put up materials as we um, on our website after, and then the YouTube link of this training as well. Um, the second question that we have um, right here, let's see, one second. Um, oh, so it was already um, essentially, let's see. Does the rent reduction apply to all apartment buildings or only rent stabilized apartments? Um, so the rent reduction, like building-wide rent reductions uh, indicates that there's a rent that's been registered or like there's a legal regulated rent. Um, so it applies to uh, rent stabilized or rent controlled apartments. Yeah, exactly. Then the next question someone had shared is what if your brownstone apartment building only has two out of 10 stabilized controlled apartments? I mean, if you're, yeah, I guess the question just to reformat is, if if someone is who dropped this question is, are you asking if two, if those the apartment in question is um, is rent stabilized and rent control, but you only have two rent stabilized apartments? Can we can we? Corporate? Yeah, can we? I mean, he wants us out, obviously, and he does everything he can to try to get us evicted. So, what can we do to protect ourselves? I mean, is two people enough, or do we have to find other stabilized, controlled people in the neighborhood to join our you know group? Um, Marilyn, do you have a, do you have an answer? That one's dialing, I think. 
Yeah. Um, well, I, I'll say like, I think, I think the answer is both, right? Like um, at, at Casa, there aren't too many market rate tenants um, in the, uh, like uh, in buildings we organize. I don't actually know if there's any, um, but I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a campaign. It's a pressure campaign. So what you have available to you, the resources that you have available to you, the allies that you know of in your neighborhood, the amount of time that you have, like these are all factors in making your organizing campaign a success. So okay. I think and any and all, right. And then like, I am aware, right. Like folks in the, you know, folks throughout the city, whether they are rent stabilized or market rate or what have you, like folks are taking risks because I think people have a different kind of political consciousness as to what the landlords are doing, I think, especially during the pandemic. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's what I would say. Thank you. Yeah. And if you're rent stabilized, you have more protection. So if you're suing in housing court, you are protected by that lease renewal. I mean, there's a different, you know, we talk, we're talking about um, filing for HP repairs in rent stabilization, but tenants who live in market rate apartments, you also have to take that into account. So, you know, unfortunately right now, the law states that there's no landlord required to provide that lease renewal. So that's something that you do want to, you know, is that something that you're interested in because retaliation does occur? You could always share that with a judge, but um, overall, if you were a rent stabilized and you're the only two out of that building, out of that brownstone, then yes, of course, you should definitely, you have that tool um, and then you have that tenant organizing um, uh, that Hal was mentioning so that you, but you have more of those protections that you're able to, to push on for. And just um, for clarification, uh, what's the definition of controlled and stabilized? Because I'm one and my neighbor's been there since the 60s or something. So she's another one where I don't think her rent goes up at all. So what's the difference? Do you know? Controlled versus stabilized? Yeah, rent, rent control is very specific. Your rent is like usually around like 600 or below at times because you've been there for so long. That's but stabilized? Rent but no that's rent control that's control rent control. then stabilizes where they can yeah. increase it okay. yeah they do increase it etc yeah. thank you um and then you get that lease renewal for one year or two year the next question how is does the ta need to register or register as a nonprofit in order to be recognized or um, should we just go ahead to organize and nominate leaders yeah that's a great question marilyn do you have an answer about the structure you, you use for your ta Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, we didn't register. We just went ahead and organized. So um, I, I guess they just recognize us as tenant association leaders, but we never register. Um, yeah, I, I would agree. Like, you know, there's tends to not be like a, a, a formal process, right? Like, and I think um, in order to make sure that um, everyone is able to participate uh, and that there's a sense of collective decision making and decision making by consensus, like we really we prioritize a pretty informal structure. Um, different ten attendant associations do things differently. Um, some folks find it helpful to have very formal roles. Um, you know, I think. Uh, in my experience, sometimes that can mean that folks uh, who even may be the organic leaders of the building who have deep relationships and who are able to um, uh, organize their neighbors to take, you know, what can be a real risk, like those folks, you know, like those folks can sometimes be shut out of, of decision making or shut out of participation, especially when you have those formal roles. Um, so I think like whatever makes sense for you all, but I think it's really the job of the organizer or organizers to um, make sure that, you know, everyone in the building is uh, participating to their, you know, fullest ability and potential. Um, which, which sometimes doesn't always happen in like a nonprofit structure or a president, vice president structure. 
And then the following question in the chat was, in regards to MCIs, can these costs be added onto rent stabilized apartments? If they fix my windows or my kitchen, can they add up to my, can they add these uh, cost to my rent. Marilyn, I think that one's for you. Well, actually, my rent did not go up. Once Once you sign a lease, that's what you're supposed to pay. Like the windows, I got new windows. My rent did not go up. And I also had a new door. I got a new um, toilet in my bathroom. My rent did not go up once I received all these new things. This is part of the things that we pay for in our rent every time we pay our rent. So, no, my rent didn't go up when I got new windows. Yeah. And I think it's like if the landlord, you know, landlords can apply for all kinds of things to defray the cost of repairs. And I think the strength of your, you know, if the landlord knows that tenants are organized and are going to fight back against um, these kinds of things, then the landlord may be less likely to do it. Yeah, exactly. Um, what happen? What happens if the landlord is NYCHA, which is considered a special landlord? The way they, what is the day? The way they deal with repairs is very different from the regular landlords. They may take years before they complete a plastic repairs by, by um, for example, unless they consider it in an emergency. What is your advice on how to deal with them? Well, I mean. I can talk about housing court, how um, you can always sue NYCHA. You can go to, um, if you you live in the household or you're part of the, um, your, your head of household, you can sue NYCHA in housing court, let the court clerk know, and they will um, quickly like stamp your documents so you don't have to, you know, uh, physically write out NYCHA's address. Um, and then you are notifying, you will notify them by mailing service. Um, but overall, it's essentially the same way where you are suing in court and then, you know, writing out all the issues that are currently happening in the um, in the apartment. But and and then getting that court date, you know, a lot of times, like you mentioned, um, that there are a lot of, you know, they do take a long time to do those repairs. But it's once you have some sort of agreement and timeline, like in, in any HP action, you are you you know, communicate to the landlord or their attorneys that this is a date that you're available. This is the time frame that you are uh, giving access to do those repairs. And if they don't come back and they don't comply with that timeline, then you can go back to court and state that they didn't, um, they didn't comply, that you need a new court date to meet with the judge so that you're able to communicate to them that this was not in, you know, they did not um, fulfill their end of the bargain and the end of the agreement that was decided in court. Um, and on, on the organizing, I'll let Hal speak a bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's like, there's a tactics question and there's an organizing question. And I mean, I think the thing that I love about organizing is that it doesn't actually end up mattering so much what the subject matter is. It's good to have some experience in it, but ultimately like the, you know, whether you're organizing, you know, um, around an environmental issue or a housing issue or in a workplace, like the, your rights may differ and what you're able to do may differ, but getting people together um, in service of a collective solution and uh, doing outreach and identifying the people who are gonna be able to move your base, like it's the same. Um, and so, I mean, we will be happy to talk more and like get into the nuts and bolts of uh, how that works. But, um, you know, NYCHA is just a bad landlord and it's not different than Maryland's landlord or um, any other landlord. May I, may I say something? Um, even with all this organizing, we still need a paper trail. Um, even though um, I run with my tenant, in the building, after a while, 
things started to deteriorate in my apartment. So I had to go back for another rent reduction. I didn't do it citywide. I did it by myself. So when I did my rent reduction, I informed the landlord what was wrong. I called 311 and told them what was wrong. I also called DHCR and got an application for another rent reduction that I got because my landlord did not repair my apartment. And also, when you get the application from DHCR, you would have to send a certified letter to the landlord that you are notifying him of these changes that he need to get done in your apartment. But most of all, we need a paper trail. Yeah. Um, and then the next question is, how to get repairs if you think your basement apartment is not legal? I can chime in on that. Um, so it is um, just like market rate apartments. We here at HCA um, kind of, you have to be very careful if you do live in an illegal basement. And unfortunately many of uh, basements are not legal because of the height to ceiling ratio. There's not a two exits. There's not enough windows. And when you are living in a basement and you are in need of repairs, if you do sue in court, then the main thing about that is that you're asking when, when suing for in a housing court for HP repairs, an inspector from the court will be sent out and HPD will be sent out to your apartment. So if they've deemed this um, space or this basement um, inhabitable or hazardous to you, then the city will get involved and then will actually may even place a vacant order onto your property and you'd only have five days to uh, move out from that um, from that basement. So you have to be very careful when you live in, uh, you know, in these types of spaces. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, from what we've seen in the um, in the floods that happened a couple of months ago, a lot of folks do live in basements and that's what's currently accessible or economical for many families. But if you do initiate some sort of case, then you you do you may be you know putting yourself at risk for a vacant order, which is the city putting you know saying that it's hazardous to you and your family, and you know you can't live there. Um, to get a repairs, I think is a begin with basements. You do have to do a lot of negotiating, which comes from like kind of organizing and having conversations with your landlord, seeing if they're able to meet you, um, you know, in some sort of middle ground, so you're able to you know, relocate to another. A lot of times it's like sewage or floods that happen in basements. So, you know, communicating to them, you can also reach out to your council member so that not necessarily HPD is getting involved, but at least um, a local council member is, you know, reaching out to the landlord on their behalf because both council members are representing tenants and homeowners. So most of that, it's like a, trying to find a, a middle ground in that. And then to next question was, um, I live in zone one hurricane area. The windows are not acceptable. Two of the rooms broke during Sandy. They replaced those. The living room window shakes during high winds and let tons of cold air. They said they won't fix or change the windows. Do I have a shot with HPD? Yeah, I would say like, and this, I would say call our hotline. I'm gonna drop our um, telephone number because this is very a very specific um, question. We do have to know more about your building. And so we're able to um, give you more information and what best procedures you can take. Give me one. And I just shared the telephone number on the chat. It's two for folks who are on phones. It's 212-962-4795. And let's see. Again, I think the last question was regards to a very specific issue. There's um, issues with the leak happening from the roof. I would suggest again, calling our hotline um, so that we're able to figure out what your best next steps could be. Um, 
you know, a lot of times if you are, you know, if you are marginalized, if you are senior citizens, we can direct you or do referrals um, for these specific cases. Um, so definitely give us a call. We are open from 9 to 6 p.m. from Tuesdays to Thursdays and Mondays is just 9 to 5. Um, so definitely give us a call um, because these last two are not necessarily questions, very, very specific. And we, we need to research your building to figure out what is currently happening. Um, and how do you want, I don't think there's any, I don't know if you saw any other questions on there. And then, oh yeah, they had asked for your email, how our CASA's email. We can drop it on the chat. Yeah, sounds good. Oh. Someone earlier um, while you were presenting. And then I think that if there's any last things that you wanted to mention in terms of repairs or you know organizing that kind of leave with leave folks with. Um, no, I mean, just that, you know, it's hard, but it's easier if you do it with people. Marilyn, is there anything else from you? No, the only thing that left for me to say is there are power in numbers. Yes, I am. Um, I love that statement, um, Marilyn. That is definitely the biggest way. And I think from just hearing how and Marilyn presenting on their on this campaign in um, ten seventy two Woody Crest, it's you know you're using all tactics and um, all your neighbor support. So I think that's like our biggest takeaway. I would suggest folks who have specific issues are dealing with housing core, are looking to file for repairs, um, give us a call. We're able to assist you. We do have two people in the Brooklyn and Queens court that help fill out um, uh, HP repair documents. And as well, um, it is, you know, if you do have a court date, it's not guaranteed, but we can provide legal referrals. Um, and then we can make sure that we can, you know, see if an attorney can reach out to you um, especially if you're living in like, you know, your ceiling has fallen, very, very dire repairs. Um, but I think that um, unless you want to add anything else, I think that's on, on my end, I don't have anything else to say. Sounds good. Thank you all. Well, Thank you, everybody. Um, do other folks have questions, actually, especially if you haven't put it in the chat? Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself if you just want to just share them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Reach out to Thank us, you. our hotline. You also. Thank you. Thank you.